Dark chocolate can help to reduce the risk of tooth decay. Dark chocolate can also aid the body with cholesterol situations. Bad LDL cholesterol levels can be lowered, and good HDL cholesterol levels can be raised by eating dark chocolate due to the antioxidants. Pamphlets distributed by the Chocolate Manufacturers Association compare the nutritional values of a one ounce milk chocolate bar to fruits such as bananas and apples. While the milk chocolate bar had 2.2 grams of protein, the banana had 1.4, and the apple only 0.3 grams of protein. So in conclusion, after learning about the numerous benefits of chocolate, would you be one of the majority of Americans who would rather have an unlimited supply of chocolate than a favorite book is stranded on a desert island? Chocolate is known to have numerous health benefits. So the next time you are searching for a healthy addition to incorporate in your diet, consider choosing chocolate. We all make them. Sometimes, if we're lucky, an eraser will do the trick. We can rub it across the page, wipe away the dust, and all that's left of our careless mess is a hardly noticeable smudge. But some mistakes can be erased, no matter how young or old we are. Betty Ann by Ina Hughes. When I was in the ninth grade, I learned to diagram sentences on the blackboard, got my learner's permit, wore my first strapless bra, wrote poetry I never read to my parents. But by far, the toughest lesson I learned was that life doesn't come with erasers. I couldn't make something that had happened not happen. Even imagination is powerless. There are no erasers. I was 14, and I wish then, and I wish now, that I could erase or imagine away what I did, what we all did, to Betty Ann. She came to our school from Cleveland, Ohio, and to our ninth grade class in Richmond, Virginia. Cleveland was another planet. Oh, hi! Oh, whispered Margie under her breath as Mrs. Johnson introduced Betty Ann in homeroom that first day. Margie could be real snooty sometimes. Nobody took her too seriously when she got in her rich kid, old money mood. She'd entertain us with crew stories and New Year gossip every afternoon as we sat on the front steps after lunch, licking the icing off Oreos and begging quarters for a Dr. Pepper from the drink machine in the gym. Margie would try and impress us in her high-pitched, bragging voice with the Vogue models she knew and how they shampooed their hair with beer, that people who ate their whole dinner with a salad fork were not the kind of people her family wanted her to marry into. Actually, Margie was as insecure and as homely as the rest of us, and her life, well, it was about as exciting as a metric system, but we all knew Margie. We all knew everybody. Most of us had been in the same class since kindergarten, except Betty Ann. Then came Betty Ann of Cleveland in her peasant blouses, rolled down socks, and strange ideas. If it had been just Margie who dug into Betty Ann, it wouldn't have turned out the way it did. She probably could have handled that, but we were all in on it. I guess what started us off was when Betty Ann wrote a better English composition than Susan Henderson. Susan was the writer of the class, and we were very proud of her. Her weekly story was always so good, Miss Moon usually chose it to read it aloud to the class. Susan would sit back at her desk, a pencil stuck behind her ear, looking to all of us just like the young literary genius we could say we once knew. The Friday after Betty Ann arrived on the scene, Susan twirled her pencil, <coughs> leaned back at her desk, and waited for the best composition of the week to be read. Hers, of course. Only it wasn't. It was Betty Ann's and about a black poet named Lanson Hughes, and how he had become a spokesman for his people. Susan's stories were always about before shows or opening nights. We never heard of Lanson Hughes. Besides, this was an all-white private school. Martin Luther King was being nailed by most of the adults we knew. All in all, it was a real bomb to have Betty Ann go about Lance and Hugh's black nativity and his description of the wounds of humanity. And Susan's stories, the telephone jingle and the rainbow paint of the sky. Stuff like that. Betty Ann was writing about the Civil War in Spain and the black ghettos of Harlem. Lance and Hughes was from Cleveland, we might have guessed. Mrs. Johnson came to the part in Betty Ann's composition where Lanson Hughes writes about a poem, how he likes watermelon so much that if he should meet the Queen of England, he'd be proud to offer her a piece. That was when Agnes Matherson's eyes caught mine. 
or was it the other way around? And we started imitating the Queen of England eating a piece of watermelon. The whole class burst out laughing. The rest of the story was never read, and everybody but Betty Ann had to stay for school and clean blackboards. The next day at lunch, Betty Ann found a note under her lettuce saying how we were sorry, but the cafeteria was showing up out of watermelon. After that, she became the class joke. What she wore, what she said, what she ate, somehow always gave one of us an idea for a wisecrack. There was a kind of one-upmanship about getting Betty Ann that had less to do with her than our own jungle mentality. I know that now, but I didn't think about it then. She became a pawn. She started getting sick a lot. There'd be whole weeks when she'd miss school. But the Betty Ann stories went on even without her. She came to our school from another planet. She was our little moron, our village idiot. Then one day, Betty Ann and I were assigned a project together. Everyone had selected a partner, and I had to be out of town at a school swimming meet the day the assignment was given. So I got stuck with her. Everyone kidding me, and I laughed with them. The day before the project was due, I had to go over to her house to work on it with her. Her mother fixed the plate of cookies and kept coming to the room to see if I wanted more Coke or anything. She said I was the only one of only one of Betty Ann's friends who had ever come over after school, but she was glad to meet me. The phone rang while I was there, and it was for me. Betty Ann's mother was in the kitchen when I heard Margie giggling at the end of the, end of the line. Have you eaten any maple sugar candy or watermelon, kiddo? She waited me to snicker an undercover laugh. I saw Betty Ann's mother just standing in the kitchen with her back to me, pretending not to be listening. It was as if she had heard everything. I hung up. I think it was at that moment when I began to see what we had been doing. Why don't you girls like Betty Ann? She likes you. Nobody had ever asked me that question before, or since then made me feel so stupid. If kindness could kill, Betty Ann would have been dead in a week. But it was too late. Her parents moved her to another school. Then we heard later that she had a nervous breakdown. Once, years later, when I was home from college, I saw Betty Ann in the doctor's office. She didn't even recognize me. Sticks and stones only break bones. Words can shatter the soul. A little quiet, picked on 10-year-old runs away because kids on the bus laugh at him. A sensitive ninth grader flips out because a group of self-rising girls decide to throw her to the wolves. We tell ourselves it takes more than that to send someone over the edge. Maybe so, maybe not, but there are no erasers. Does a teddy bear strike terror in your heart? Do you view music as a menace? Is fear a word you associate with ceiling fans, chairs, and tables? Well, hopefully none of this is true for you. But on second thought, maybe it should be. Take a moment to think about the things people fear the most. Venomous snakes, supernatural creatures, or zoo attractions such as gorillas and bears. Then consider that the Human Mortality Database found in an 89-year span, only 82 Americans were killed by bears, while their cuddly counterparts ended at least 22 lives yearly. According to the U.S. National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, every year thousands of people are killed and hundreds of thousands more are injured by everyday objects, like the teddy bear or even dishwashers and dust. But why are so many being injured by such everyday things? Perhaps it's because the media controls our fears and it's not too easy to make tap water seem terrorizing. Or maybe it's just that when we're familiar with an object, we tend to get a little careless. Whatever the reason, these perils are so hazardous, they have their own book. It's the 100 Most Dangerous Things by Laura Lee, and today we'll explore some of these strangest legal objects outlined within its covers. First up on the deadly list is something every kid has uttered at least once. I'm bored. Yes, boredom kills. 
literally. In fact, a study done by Dr. Benjamin C. Amick III states that assembly line workers are more likely than doctors to die young. Clinical depression can result from persistent boredom, and of the 10 million Americans currently suffering from depression, 10% will take their own lives. So, as Alan Karuba, the founder of the Boring Institute said, the next time someone tells you they're bored to death, take them seriously. Most people do try to avoid boredom, but what about the things they don't even care to avoid? Actually, this next hazard is something most teenage girls are throwing themselves in the path of. This danger could be nothing but cute guys. Scientists at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland believe women dub baby faces cute because it makes men seem more gentle and nurturing. In other words, good dads. This baby face stereotype goes beyond dating, though, straight into the court of law. A study of rape cases in 1981 showed that while 82% of those thought to be unattractive were convicted, the men considered good-looking were only convicted 57% of the time. This next hazard won't lead you to commit suicide or get you out of a conviction, <coughs> but it could get you sicker than when you first arrived. The hospital is an unexpected danger to any who dare to enter it. Doctors are dangerous, said the American Medical News Service. Their studies show doctors are not washing their hands on a regular basis, not even between patients. The patients themselves are another large factor. They're infected with any number of things, and they're all together in a closed building sharing the same equipment. All of this leads to the traveling of infectious germs leaving one out of every 20 hospital patients infected with something they didn't already have. After hearing all this, you may be thinking it would just be safest to go home and rearrange your lawn ornaments. Sorry, I wouldn't advise it, and neither would the nearly 11,000 Americans yearly hurt by many a lawn decoration. It's clear to see that even though they're not running around, Plastic pink flamingos, bird baths, statues of the Virgin Mary, and garden gnomes still trip people up. Speaking of garden gnomes, don't go and try to return these little industrious men to their natural habitat. It's a crime. In 1997, the leader of the Garden Gnome Liberation Front found this out after he was sentenced to prison for returning 150 gnomes their natural home, the woods. After hearing all, now you really must be thinking it would just be safest to go home, climb into bed, and stay there forever. No, I'm sorry, that's still not safe. In the U.S. alone, over 411,000 people are injured by their beds in an average year. Also, the U.S. Product Safety Commission Board found in 1998 more than 18,000 house fires began with the bedding. Finally, I present to you a hazard which cannot be escaped. It is the only danger I can give you a full 100% guarantee that it will end in death. This menacing source is life itself. 2002 estimations by the Population Reference Bureau reason there to have been around 106 billion people alive throughout the history of mankind. Today, there's only 6.5 billion still living. That's only about 6% left. It's an inevitable fate, and no matter if we are young, old, or somewhere in between, we will all come to the same end. As you see, the moral of today's story is to avoid boredom, cute guys, hospitals, lawn ornaments, beds, and life. <laughs> well, not really, but it is to bring recognition to the fact that such things can be dangerous, yet easily avoided if we have a little care for what we're doing. In all, I don't mean to scare
care or work.